reporter Caroline Spitznagel, and we're here today at Studio 620 for our Art of Boat Building and the Water is Wide exhibit. Today you're going to learn about the history and culture of building boats from Key West to Cedar Key. For those of you not from Florida, that basically means the entire Gulf Coast of Florida. Let's go take a look and see what they're doing inside. All right, so here's a little bit of boat building right here. It looks interesting. Let's see what's going on. Hi, sir. What's your name? Hi, I'm Alan. Um, what are you doing there? We're beveling the transom. When the planks come down to the transom, they're not straight. They're at an angle. So you've got to bevel this to fit it. So how does this relate to the whole building of the boat? This is the transom that the, all the planks tie into at the stern. Okay. And because it comes in at an angle, we have to bevel this so they lay flat against the trench and make a good seal. And oh, wow. Leak. So it's uh, a lot of handwork, but it's uh, what you have to do okay. to get it done. So about how many of these do you have to make? Well, the one transom on the back, mm -hmm. the ribs are, sti are uh, bent, they're laminated, and they're bent for the frames. This is just the okay. transom, it's the only solid piece. The others okay. are made like this. We shape these around a form, and it's layers. It's like 12 or 13 layers with epoxy clamped around a form to give the shape. And when it hardens, that becomes the rib. Oh, okay. So we, make, we have to make nine of those for the boat. And the main rib is already in there, the center Thor chips. And we're making eight more of these. And it gives, basically, that shapes the boat. And the boat changes shape as it goes. So okay. every one of these is different. You can't make a bunch of them. Everyone has to be done. done. It's shaped, the boat is shaped over here where you got the slats that give you the form of the boat. So each one of these has to be fitted individually. Okay. So it reinforces the shape. Oh, takes, wow, okay. It takes a lot of time, but it's a lot of fun. Yeah, and so what kind of wood are you working with? This wood is different from the rest of the boat. This is hard pine. It's gummy and it's hard to work with, but it's very strong. It doesn't rot. It stays moist. It just gums up all the tools. Oh, okay. But it's worth doing because it lasts. The transom is the toughest part to replace. And if you keep that one in the last you can re-plank the boat or put in other pieces, and this will last. So it's worth the effort. It's just hard to find hard pine. And these, that's a pretty wide plank. Yeah. Very rare to see planks that wide. Otherwise, you'd have to piece it and clamp them together. This way, we got one piece out of it. And it really works well. I would carve the name in the back, except I got two left hands, and I can't carve straight. <laughs> so we get someone else to do that. Oh, OK. We got lots of guys with lots of different skills. And they range from carpenters and electricians to doctors and lawyers. There will be 10 or 20 guys over the period of the boat building that work on it. Uh, just whoever's around and says, gee, that looks interesting, I'll work on that. So it's, uh, they call it the adult daycare center, so all the fellas come and work in the shop. A lot of fun. So about how big do you think this boat will be? When it's a 15-footer. It, the original boat was a 9-foot sailing dinghy designed in 1900 by a fellow named Frank Bethel. And his, name, his wife's name was Charity, so this boat is called Charity. Oh, okay, so it has a history, too. And we, we took his nine-foot boat and stretched it out to 15, so that changed the shape of the hull. It brings the hull in narrower and longer. It's a sleeker boat, and instead of being a sailboat, this one's going to be a rowboat. It's got two, two rowing positions, and it'll, uh, the shape is coming up fine. It's thinner and trimmer. I think it's going to cut the water beautifully. We're excited to see that done and see how it works. And we hope that this is the first of a fleet. Which, uh, the Maritime Museum will have a launching pad within the next six months. We want a place that people can come and just try out boats, rowboats and sailboats. All right, well, thank you for your time. It's been very interesting. It's been fun. Thank you. Take care. Interesting. What are you doing here? Well, we have a little model of a dugout uh, canoe in the process of being burned out. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this is how, uh, before metal tools uh, that they hollowed out tree trunks that people right around here in this county um, that they would burn out these logs and they would make a, a, a dugout uh, canoe and all you need is just a few simple tools you need fire and some mud and you need uh, a little bit of water a stick and a fan and that's about all you need to make a, a dugout. So about how long do you think that we'll have this fire going on here? Well, I'll be here all afternoon, and it 
it would take, uh, if it was an average size dugout, uh, you know, 15 to 25 feet long, um, about that wide or a little, a little, a little wider. Um, the one I made took about a hundred hours, but then that was the first one I ever ever made, and I imagine these seven people were very experienced and probably take them a lot less time. And uh, so, you know, I don't know, maybe half that time, you know, because experience is a, a wonderful thing. So this and is a long history of doing this, right? In the state here? Um, yes, we have found in the state of, of Florida, they have found um, more dugout canoes in this state than any other other state, and it numbers up in the in the hundreds. There's um, a lake up around Gainesville that it went dry. I forget what year it was, 2004, and I think they found over a hundred dugouts buried in the in the mud in that uh, that lake alone. And um, the oldest one that's been dated dates back to 7,000 years ago, and another one. 6,000. Actually, even the early Anglo settlers uh, did the same thing, only they had m metal tools, and once you get m metal tools, um, uh, it's a lot easier uh, to hack it out. It may not be easier, but it's faster, and, uh, you know, everyone likes things fast, you know. You could use the stone and the, and the shell tools on this. This is your Sequest Kids KBN Sea Action News reporter Xanthia Reeves. So these are adzes. These are used for uh, shaping wood, basically, and for hollowing out bowls, uh, masks, anything that has a concave uh, in inside. And if they if they had stone, they use stone. But down here, you can't find any. Um, stone that holds an edge. All we have right now from here south, limestone, sandstone, a little bit of flint, but you know, uh, so uh, they went to shell and, and these shells, uh, they hold up really, really, really well. And uh, so um, there's another, that type of ax that they used in, um, in South Florida, that's made from the queen conch. The queen conch is the type of conch you eat. If you've eaten conch fritters and things like that, it's, um, that's the outer lip of, of the adults, and, and they get real thick. Okay. And, uh, so this is a, a stone edge, and it, it works wood real well also. So, so you can hollow things out and make things flat. And that's rawhide. And that's... Uh, now, what's the edge of that? Is that wood? With this? Yeah. No, stone. Oh, that's a stone there. Yeah. Okay, so the stone is connected by the... Rawhide. Rawhide. The wood comes all the way here, but, but it's scooped out, so this lays in there, rawhide holds it in there, and uh, the hide glue, glue binds that all together and keeps it from jarring, and it just makes a one solid mass around there. Okay, and uh, uh, this is a, uh, this head here is probably 2,000 years old. It's a grooved ax, and it's, it, it's the only original thing here, and whoever made it broke it, and then just sharpen this up on a, a stone and just made the cutting edge there. These are always loosen up and everything and a lot of maintenance. And then a few thousand years ago, somebody invented the silt and you cut a hole in the wood and it wedges in there. And uh, 
you find these all all different sizes, small ones. I've I've seen some this big. It's just so much easier. See, we've been talking here for a few minutes, and I haven't expended much energy. And I'll go check the fire, and you check the, the char when it gets uh, cracks in it. Then it's time, <coughs> pardon me, to and take the stick and chip it off, and throw that out because the char acts as insulation and the deeper the char then the slower it burns so when i made a, a full uh, size one well we only burned half of it and that way when it came time to scrape the char you moved all of your fire over in the unburned part mm -hmm. and you had all this empty scrape out the char take a bark scoop or something scoop it out remud it and uh, that way you didn't have to start up a new fire and that takes a long time. So you just, we did it in parts and uh, um, you didn't have all that startup time. So, so we just moved the fire back and forth, overlapped it in the middle sometimes uh, to keep it nice and even. And if you know how to uh, arrange the fire properly, it, burns it nice and smooth. It looks like somebody's scraped it out, you know. What variety of tree do you think would be used to make this sort of canoe? Uh, of all of the prehistoric Native American ones found in the state of, of Florida, uh, I think I can safely say a hundred percent of them were pine. Then once you got up into modern times, started getting metal tools, the uh, Seminoles made almost 100% of them out of cypress. Uh, and then I think, um, you know, I, I don't know what any of the Anglo ones are made out of, but I d do know that the, uh, the prehistoric ones used uh, pine. Probably because pines grow straight and tall and the thing with pine, um, almost all of the flame in that one right there now is made from all of the pine tar, pine sap that's oozing out of the log. So you, once you get a nice hot fire and a charcoal fire is best, that's a little too big now. You can't control it. So I might take some of it out. Um, and so you'd actually use less fuel. You wouldn't have to, uh, to be rounding up wood and sticks and every everything. So that that might be a reason the nice tall straightness of them and it has its own pitch in there to uh, to help burn. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for teaching us about oh, uh, dugout canoes. Sure, you're welcome. What we're doing is we're completing the restoration of that natural habitat. And it's right adjacent to the schoolhouse preserved grounds. And we've just finished doing the landscape around the schoolhouse and we're connecting the schoolhouse grounds now to that 100 acres with bridges and trailways that will go back in there. And there'll, there's going to be signage that'll explain exactly what the habitat is that people are looking at and how it relates to the activities that traditionally occurred in Cortez. Another thing that's going on in the preserve right behind the, the schoolhouse building is we've just moved the oldest commercial building in the village of Cortez. It's, a, it's called the 1890s Burton Store. Originally it was a store that was built out over the water and then eventually they filled out around the building and added a whole bunch of wings onto it and it became a thing called the Albion Inn. And it was right on the water, and back in the 70s, the Coast Guard bought the site. And they thought that it would be a great location because of where it is in relationship to Tampa Bay and Sarasota Bay and all of the inlets. So the Coast Guard bought it, and it, for a while they were content to be in the old wooden building. But they decided that they needed a state-of-the-art modern building. So they started tearing down the old building. And the villagers said, well, you can't. That's the oldest building in Cortez. We have to stop you. And they said, well, how about we give you the building? You just have to move it. So the villagers did. They actually got some money together and they moved the building literally across the street. And it sat on a house movers trailer for 12 years. And they kept looking for another place to put it and looking for a place to put it. Well, about five years ago when we started the schoolhouse renovation, 
we started talking with them. Now, the county owns the schoolhouse property, but it was bought because the villagers requested it. So we talked with the county and we talked with the villagers and we came to an agreement that the Burton store really would be an appropriate building to be on the schoolhouse preserve site. So last Christmas, we moved it finally and we put it on its new foundation. And we're right now in the process of doing a restoration of that building. And inside there, we're going to have, uh, we, one of our nonprofits is the Cortez Village Historical Society, which is primarily concerned with the genealogy of Cortez, all of those families that I mentioned. And so they're going to have a research room there and offices there. There's going to be a classroom down on the first floor, which is a, we're calling it the heritage classroom because we have natural heritage, which is the environment, and we have man-made heritage, which is maritime heritage and traditions, man-made things. And our classroom is to combine those two in our heritage programming to talk about man in the environment and fishermen in particular, because that's what the village is concerned about. And so the classroom will be there. It's going to have a recreation of the original general store, which was in the bottom of the Burton store, and the post office. The original post office structure is going to be in there. We have uh, a, a boat building shop, which is run by Bob Pitt. You met him a little earlier. Uh, Bob is our master boat builder. And Bob is a very important person on our staff because uh, I'm also trained as a traditional boat builder, but my background is Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware's traditions. And this is Florida. And what we want to do is preserve Florida's traditional boat building skills. Now, Bob is a fifth generation Floridian. And his whole boat building experience has been Florida's boat building experience. So Bob runs our traditional boat building program. And if you come to the museum and you want something really fun to do, wear your work clothes. We'll put you right to work. You can work in the boat shop along with the 20 other volunteers that work there on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, or Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. I think they're working now. We also have the Main Hatch Motley group that works out of the museum, and that's a bunch of sea shanty singers. You recorded earlier a great sea shanty program. Well, we have a sea shanty group down there that works. And we also are affiliated with the Tampa Bay Ship Model Society that's also represented here. So the Maritime Museum has a lot of, it's multifaceted. And another really fun part of the Maritime Museum is we have a group called the Traditional Small Craft Association. And that's actually made up of people that have wooden boats like this and like to use them. And they like to get together and do trips. And so we have a festival, we call it the Great Florida Gulf Coast Small Craft Festival. And it's coming up in April. And at the festival, People are invited from all over the country to bring their traditional boats and they come and the idea is that anybody else that comes to the show, whether you've ever been in a boat before, is invited to go out sailing with us or go out sailing in one of the boats. And if you know how to sail and we can figure out that you know how to sail, you can actually take the boats out on your own. So it's really a great way to get into small boat sailing and things like that. And it's all different kinds. It's rowboats and sailboats and there are some traditional power boats and and sailboats and things like that, so it's really a lot of fun. But what's the difference between your boat building experience tradition and Bob's boat building? Okay, um, that's actually a, a kind of a complicated question. The tradition that I grew up in is actually English and Dutch, and all of the boat building methods and the style of the boats are substantially different than the boats that developed here. Florida has a very interesting history. If you look at the way it actually developed, it kind of went in these spurts where you have a population that dominated the area and then it gets really quiet for a while and then there's a whole new population, a new culture that comes in and dominates the area. Like the earliest, of course, we have the, a very strong Spanish influence on both coasts and then the Spanish influence kind of really doesn't take off very well. Then the British come in for a while, the French are here very briefly and all of that. Well then, um, up there, you actually have the Dutch coming in and the Dutch settle and stay and the Swedes come in and they marry in and they stay and then the British come in, of course, with William Penn and all of that and they all, the traditions blend and they produce some very specific types of boats that require specific building methods. Down here, the tradition in, that we're mostly interested in really isn't something that takes place until after the Civil War. That's when this coast, the, the big settlements really start to occur here. And the boat building in America has become very sophisticated and what happens with boats is boats actually develop for the area where they work. Um, like the boats in Cortez, for example, in our village. Those fishermen all came from North Carolina and they brought their technology with them from North Carolina and the types of boats they used were the types of boats they used up in North Carolina. And the boats they used were very interesting. They were 21 feet long, for example. And a 21 foot long boat is, I mean, why 21 feet? Well, they actually figured out from long usage 
that 21 feet is actually the wavelength of the normal wave in the bays where they work because of the prevailing wind and the shallow water. So a 21-foot boat works perfectly. A 22-foot boat would be just a little sloppy. You'd get some water slopping over it. Or a 19-foot boat wouldn't quite do the job they wanted to do or might be a little small and the motion wouldn't be quite acceptable. But over a 100-year period, they figured out that a 21-foot boat was exactly the right length to do this job. So that type of boat was, after the first one was built, it became the boat that everyone wanted to have because it just did the job so well. Now, they brought it down here. And they brought it to Cortez, and they started using it in Cortez. Well, fairly quickly, they found out that 21 feet and whatever else there was about this boat really didn't work. So within one generation, the boats had started changing substantially so that they fit the area where they came from now. They now belonged in a different area where the water didn't have the same prevailing wind blowing 15 knots forever and ever and ever and ever. You know, the wind here is calm one day, a lot of wind the next day. It's a different boat you need. So the, the tradition I grew up in... Um, you have long sandy beaches that are Atlantic coast beaches where you have large waves. So that you have round bottom boats that can work off the beach, for example. And you have shallow bays, really, really shallow bays like the Barnegat Bay in New Jersey. And so you have boats that develop for that. And one of the big maritime activities up there was duck hunting, believe it or not. That's actually a maritime activity in New Jersey. And so boats developed that were perfect for hunting ducks in marshes where ducks lived. Now, the other place in New Jersey in that area is the Delaware Valley and the Delaware Bay. And the Delaware Bay is a deep bay. The strong prevailing wind comes in from the south, so you have very substantial waves. So the boats actually were larger and had to be quite a bit more substantial than the boats that developed on the coast of Florida, where you have a very, very moderate weather pattern. Most of the weather is not serious. You don't get large waves. You don't have really big you know, wave patterns blowing onto a beach. So our boats up there were substantially different. The methods for building them also reflected the materials available in New Jersey and Delaware Valley. Uh, we have white cedar. Down here we use cypress. Uh, white cedar is looked, up, uh, looked upon as not quite the material that cypress is. Cypress is considered a better material here. Well, in some ways it is. Up there we use white oak. Down here we use yellow pine. Yellow pine is a very resinous wood that will withstand the hot temperatures and the high humidity that cause rot in other trees. Oak doesn't do quite as well. Oak has, oak has different working characteristics than yellow pine. Oak, you can put it in a steam box and bend it. You can get any shape you want. Yellow pine is very rigid. If you try to bend it, it wants to splinter and break. And it's also much more resistant to it. So the methods that I, do, that I learned up there, the tradition up there, included white oak and bent boats and round bottom boats and lighter construction but a stronger kind of boat for size because it was a larger boat actually. Uh, here they were a little simpler boats, more protected water and things like that. So my tradition of course is superior, <laughs> which is why I don't run the shop. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.